All right. Do you have any that you can uh, verbalize or? Uh, yeah, I just can't verbalize all these. Okay. All right. So the first one is. I'll, hold on, you ne you're going to need to enunciate a little more clearly. If F equals 6. F as in Frank? Yeah. G equals 10. H equals 12. Then 2F. Well, what would it be? Um, 12 plus uh, 50, so 72. Okay. And then H over G. These are pretty straightforward with the way they're giving them to you. Uh, what does that simplify to? Uh, that's uh, 6 over 5. All right. Or 1 and 1 fifth. 1 and 1 fifth. Although you're going to find with math that you rarely really want to use proper fractions. You, you, yeah, you generally want to use improper fractions. 6 fifths is a better answer than 1 and 1 fifth, believe it or not. And it kind of has to do with trig is all about ratios, calculus is about ratios. So we, we rarely deal with proper fractions. We're dealing with ratios all the time. Yeah. Is the next one uh, different F, G, and H? Um, different problem? I mean, should I erase yeah. that? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so if A equals negative 5, B equals 10, C equals 1, then 7A minus B plus B equals Okay. What's seven A equal to? It's negative forty. Negative thirty five? Negative 54. In other words, that's negative 55. That is the same as minus 35 plus a minus 20. Yeah. So that's minus 55. If I add 1 to minus 55, I get minus 54. Okay. Okay. Then we have A, B, C, minus C. Hold on. In other words, the next part was A times B times C minus C? Uh, that's A, B, C, yeah. That's what it is. Okay. What's A, B, C? A times B is negative 50. Times C is 50. Still negative 50. When you multiply any number by 1, it does not change. So the answer is negative 49. No. What's minus 50 minus 1? Oh, positive 49. No. Positive 51. 
No. <laughs> Do you have a calculator in front of you? No. All right. Well, let's go over how you do this. This is the most, the big, this produces the biggest mistakes of anything. The reason is, is that one of these dashes is a negative sign. The other dash is a subtraction sign. That's, that's the subtraction right there. So the way to do these is to turn the subtraction into an addition and change the sign on what was being subtracted. Well, what was being subtracted was a positive one, so I'm going to add a negative one. Now, nobody makes a mistake when it's written like that. What's that? Negative 51. Okay. So, if that gives you any problems at all and you don't have a calculator around to do it, Always do it this way here. Change the subtraction sign into an addition sign and change the plus or minus sign on what was being subtracted. In other words, if I had 50 minus a minus 1, I change it to addition and then I change the sign. So that becomes 51. So, subtraction is always easier if you turn it into addition. In other words, the only problems you don't really need to turn into addition are the ones where you have a bigger number minus a smaller number, and they're both positive. Well, in this case, just do it as a subtraction problem. That's the easiest way to do it. But when you're dealing with a minus 9, minus 7, now change it to an addition problem, and you have minus 9 plus minus 7, that's minus 16. Okay. Um, and the next problem is, uh, oh, that's, uh, maybe a different one. Different, different A, B, and C? No, it's like a different problem. Okay. Um, the area of this rectangle is 80 feet squared. Eighty square feet, okay. Yeah. What is the length and width? And there's an X on the left side. This is X? So how do you get area? Um, you multiply the base and the height. Okay. So area equals what in terms of x? Um, something times 80. Oh, no, no, no. Well, hold on. Let's, let's leave the 80 out first. Let's just come up with an equation for area based on x. You said it, it's the base times the height. Well, what does that translate to? <coughs> x times x plus 16, right? Yeah. That's the base times the height. Yeah. Well, that's equal to x squared plus 16x. And they're telling us that when we do that, we get an area of 80. So that's the equation we have to solve. Okay. In other words, we end up with a quadratic. How do I solve that quadratic? Um, x squared plus 16x squared. How do we solve that? You move the 80. I, I couldn't quite hear what you said. You move the 80 uh, well, to the left side, and you always want zero on the other side. In other words, if I get a quadratic equals zero, then it's all I have to do is factor the quadratic, and I'll be able to solve the problem. Without doing that, I have no way of solving the problem. 
As long as it's like that, I can't, I can't solve it. In fact, I can't even solve it when I get it like that. But what I can do is now factor it. Well, how do you factor this? X, X. What are both signs? Well, the signs, always do your factoring in steps. If you do the same three steps every time, you won't have any problem with factoring. And the first step is split up your x's. The second step is determine both signs. Well, both signs have to be opposite. That's the only way I can produce a minus 80. Remember, you get this minus 80 from the L of FOIL. In other words, it's the last two numbers multiplied together is what produce that minus 80. Okay, so we okay. know that the two numbers that I've still got to fill in here have to multiply to 80. And because of this minus sign, they have to subtract to 16. Well, let's look at factors of 80. If I try to factor 80, always Cut that in half and double that if I can. Do it again if you can. Bingo, we just found our factors. We found factors of 80 that subtract to the number 16. Now, 20 and 4 is what goes in there, but which one goes with the positive sign? Um, would it be a uh, The Well, it's either 20 or 4, but the larger of those two fat, we've found our factors. Yeah. The larger of the factor goes with the sign of the middle term. The sign of the middle term is a plus. The larger factor is 20. So the 20 goes there, the 4 goes there. Okay. Now you got a solution because it gives you two solutions. It tells you... Okay. In other words, based on that, I know that x is either minus 20 or 4. Yeah. In this problem, which is it? Uh, is it? Can it be minus 20? Yeah. No, you can't have negative dimensions. In other words, because this is a real problem regarding a rectangle, one thing we know for sure is that all sides of a rectangle have positive dimensions. Okay. It's impossible to have a negative dimension. It's like time. You can't have negative time. Okay? So, yeah. since I know that X has to be positive, this is an extraneous solution right there, the minus 20. I throw it out. And you might say, well, how can you do that? It, was a, it looks like a solution as good as 4. Well, not really. What the fundamental rule of algebra says is that if I have two things multiplied together that are equal to 0, the only thing that's necessary is that one of them has to be 0. There's nothing in algebra that says both of them have to be 0. Yeah. 1 has to be 0. Well, if I let x equal 4, it makes that one 0. And now 0 times whatever that is, is 0. So it's not always true that both solutions are valid. Yeah. You have to take it in context with the nature of the problem. And since we're talking about a geometry problem where everything has to be positive, then I throw out the negative solution that I got. Okay. okay. And then if we want to check, well, does 4 work? That would make that 4, and it would make this 20. 4 times 20 is 80. So an x value of 4 works perfectly fine. Okay. Okay. You did say B is in boy? No, no, it's not 
D is in David? Yeah. And then minus 6D squared. Add it? Yeah. Okay. We gotta well, whenever you're factoring something, notice that I don't have a constant here. So this is going to follow different rules than my quadratic. When we were looking at my quadratic, I had a constant of minus 80. Well, this doesn't have a constant. And the first rule of factoring is always try to take out a greatest common factor. So let's, okay. let's do that. What's the greatest common factor I can take out? Um, can you two? Well, I can take out a d oh, to the power of 2 for sure, but I can also take out a number. 6. No? 6 doesn't go into 10. What's the biggest number that divides into 10 and 6 evenly? Um, 2. 2. Yeah. If you're dealing with even numbers, they can always be each divided by 2. So that's my greatest common factor. Now what's left over? And you get what's left over by dividing each term by that greatest common factor. In other words, just go ahead and do that division, and whatever you get goes here. What's 10d to the 6 divided by 2d squared? Um, what does the uh, minus 6 squared mean? Do the number first and then do the D. What's 10 divided by 2? No. 5D um, to the power of 3. 4. Because we're dividing, we subtract the exponents. And then now, before you, before you do the second one, the secret of math is always to be checking. Okay? And what I mean by that is once I've written 5d to the fourth, do that multiplication. Make sure you get 10d to the sixth. Do you? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. That means we did it right. We did the first part right. Now do the second part. What's 6d squared divided by 2d squared? That is 3d. Just 3. The d squares cancel. And you're, lo you're left with just 6 divided by 2. Okay, and again, multiply those two together to make sure you got what you started with, and you'll see that you do. Okay. Okay. Now, that's the most we can factor it, at least with what they've taught you. That's going to be your answer. It is possible to factor that a little bit further, but they don't want you to do that, not at this point in algebra. So this is your answer. In other words, if that whole thing was an equation and I needed to factor it, now I got this thing multiplied by this thing equals zero, and I can solve it by setting this equal to zero, setting this equal to zero, and solving each one. Okay. So... Whether it's an equation or an expression, in other words, you gave it to me as just an expression, not an equation, which is fine. You, you can certainly factor expressions, and that's what we did. Okay? So when they say factor something, it isn't always an equation. It's just that in order to solve an equation, you generally have to factor it and set it equal to zero, and then you can proceed with the solution. Minus 15? 16. I thought so. Yeah. Because they haven't taught you how to do 15 yet. Yeah. They have actually taught you how to do this. Notice what we're looking at. 
we are looking at the difference of perfect squares. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about difference of perfect squares. Okay. A squared minus B squared is the difference of perfect squares, no matter what A or B is. Okay? okay. And it always factors to A minus B times A plus B. Okay? So okay. if I had X squared minus 4, that would factor into X minus 2, times x plus 2, right? This term here is always the square root of that. This term here is always the square root of that. So, let's apply that logic to what we have here. Okay. What is the square root of m to the fourth? Um, m to the second? Yeah. And the first one's always minus. The second one's always plus. It's the other yeah. thing of difference of perfect squares. Is it's one's the conjugate of the other. And what's the square root of sixteen? Uh, four. Now once you figure out the first one, you don't really need to do any work on the second one. By that I mean the following. In other words, I don't even need that there. As long as I figure out that the a minus b is m squared minus 4, then I know the next one is automatically m squared plus 4. I don't have to do any math, okay? Now, they probably said fully factor it? No. Well, they usually mean that. When they say factor something, they mean factor it all the way down. Well, okay. I can factor that further. That's also the difference of perfect squares. What's that factor into? Uh, Take the square root of m squared. What's that? What's the square root of 4? 2. Always make your first term with the minus. What's this going to be? There you go. And that's completed. Now, you might say, well, how come I can't factor that? Well, there is no factoring difference of, or excuse me, sum of perfect squares. Sum of perfect squares does not factor. If I gave you a squared plus b squared, I can't factor that. Got to, The difference of perfect squares you can factor, but not the sum. So when we wow. end up with the sum of perfect squares, we're done. That's the final answer. In other words, I've factored everything that I can factor. Okay. Okay? Right. What else you got? Oh, well, uh, this is my last one. Okay. It's the term of the x intercept of the function. Okay. f of x equals 2x squared plus 18x plus 28. Plus 28, did I write it correctly? Yeah. Okay. That is a quadratic. Quadratics yeah. produce what kind of shapes? Um, what are they parabola. called? Parabolas. Parabolas are going to look something like that. And I know that it opens up because it's got a positive leading coefficient. If that was a negative 2, it would open down. Okay? Question is, is where are these x-intercepts? Let me draw this thing a little different. Well, what is true about the x-intercept? About f of x? In other words, I'm not calling that y. I'm going to call it f of x, the vertical axis. That's the horizontal axis. What's true about f of x at that point and that point? Um, x is 0. Ah, that means now I'm going to let f of x equal 0 and solve this quadratic. Okay. And one thing, keep in mind, when they ask for x-intercepts, that means y is 0. 
In this case, y is the same as f of x. That's always true. You can always replace f of x with y. It's just different notation, okay? Also, if they ask for the y-intercept, that's where x is equal to zero, correct? Yeah. Well, what would the y-intercept on this function be? Um, yeah, in other words, it's really easy to find the y-intercept because when you set x equal to zero, these first two terms disappear. So you got y equals 28 if they wanted to know the y-intercept. x-intercept is going to be a little harder. We're going to have to do some math, which means factoring. What's the first thing I can do to simplify this thing a little bit? In other words, factoring is always easier if you do not have a coefficient other than 1 in front of the x squared. If I make the coefficient 1, and, I can, and if I can do that, then you're dealing with an elementary factoring problem. If yeah. it's anything other than 1, then you're dealing with a higher degree of difficulty in factoring, significantly higher. Yeah. And those tend to be trial and error factoring exercises. Yeah. But by that, I mean... It, it, They've probably taught you an exotic method, the diamond method or the California method or some method of doing them. And those work, it's just they're hard. And there's a lot of trial and error involved. But what can I do to this thing to turn it into an elementary quadratic? Um, What's the greatest common factor? In other words, whenever you're looking at a factoring problem, always consider that first. Yeah. Can I take out a greatest common factor? Yes. What? Uh, I, would not take I can take 2 out. I can't take any number of x out, but I can take 2. The, okay. Remember, the only thing you need is to be able to divide every term evenly. So I got to divide that by two, that by two, and that by two, and I can do that. Yeah. Okay. And what does that give you? That's what factoring is. Okay. So the first term is what? Um, it is x squared. Okay. Second term? Minus. And third term? Okay. Now, notice what we can do. I can divide both sides of this equation by 2. When I divide the right side by 2, I still have 0. When I divide the left side by 2, it gets rid of that 2 right there. So, by factoring out that 2, I've simplified it to a level 1 quadratic. And we can use a set of simple rules to factor these level 1 problems, always. Yeah. These are not difficult at all. First step, yeah. split up the x's. Second step, determine both signs. What are both signs got to be? Uh, one can plus minus. No? How can I produce? I wouldn't produce a plus 14 if that were the case. Yeah. No, the signs have to be the same. They either have to be both plus or they have to be both minus. Okay. That's the only way you can produce a plus. Remember where this third term. So what factoring is, is foiling in reverse. Okay. If I multiplied x plus 2 times x plus 7, there's the f. There is the O, there's the I, and here's the L. Notice that the L produces the plus 14. If both signs were different, if one was plus and one was minus, then that last term would be negative 14. So we use that principle in factoring. In other words, when we're factoring, I know the signs have to be the same 
and they're either minus minus or plus plus. We look to the sign of the middle term. It's plus, therefore they're plus plus. Yeah. Now, okay. the third step, relatively easy. Two numbers that multiply to 14 and add to 9. Add because of that plus that's in front of the 14. If that were a minus, then I would want two numbers that multiply to 14 that subtract to 9. But it's a plus. So what two numbers multiply to 14 and add to 9? Um, to nine two. Yeah. And it doesn't matter which goes where. As long as both signs are the same, I can put the 2 here and the 7 there, or vice versa. Okay. Okay. Now, if they said solve the equation, what are my two solutions? Um, what is, um, the way you do this is set that equal to 0 and solve it. So, if I have x plus 7 equals 0, what is x? Um, uh, negative 7. Okay. And if I have x plus 2 equal to 0, what is x? Uh, negative 2. Those are your two solutions. Yeah. Now, um, that means they wanted us to find the x-intercepts. So now I know how to draw my quadratic. I go to minus 2. I go to minus 7. And I know the parabola has to go through both of those. Yeah. So it's got to look something like that. Okay. Now I don't know much else. I don't know the y coordinate of the vertex. But I do know the line of symmetry. It's halfway between minus 2 and minus 7. So I know the x-coordinate of that vertex have to be minus 3.5. Minus 4, excuse me, 4.5, sorry. Okay. And then the y-coordinate, whatever, you'd have to do more math to figure it out. But she didn't ask you about that. She just asked you what were the x-intercepts, which yeah. means that y has to be 0. That's what y is at those two points, is 0. Yeah. And that's why we solved it by setting f of x equal to 0. That was our yeah. starting point, was changing that to 0, and then going from there. Okay. What else? Okay. That's all you have? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me give you one just to make sure you get it. All right. I've got to think of one here. Just a second. Um, 3x squared uh, minus 9x minus 30. If I said that's f of x, find the zeros of it. So you're going to set the whole thing equal to zero, because that's what y would have to be to find the x-intercepts. First step? Um, what do we need to uh, find a common factor? Is there a greatest common factor? Yeah, there is. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. If there isn't, then I have to solve it as a higher degree of difficulty quadratic. But yeah. if I can take out a greatest common factor and reduce it to an elementary quadratic, that's going to save me a whole lot of work. So what can I remove? What can I factor out? Right. Leaving what? Minus 3x, because oh, yeah. okay, I'm dividing that by 3. Minus 10. Okay. 
Now I can do the same trick I did before, divide both sides by 3, effectively getting rid of that. Doesn't change the right side, the right side stays 0. So now is all we have to do is factor this elementary quadratic. Okay, do it the way I did it before. Split the x's up, step 1. What are both signs? Um, Didn't quite hear that. X minus an X plus. Yeah, the signs have to be opposite. Yeah. I don't have to put the minus on the left. I could put the plus on the left. As long as it's X and X, it doesn't matter. But the signs have to be opposite. Now, okay. what's the third rule that applies here for finishing out this problem? I need factors of 10 that do what? Uh, no, you need factors of 10 that subtract, because of that negative sign, to the number 3. Well, let's figure out factors of 10. We got 10 and 1, we got 5 and 2, I just found my two factors. 5 and 2 are the two numbers we want. Yeah. 5 goes where? With the negative or the plus? Right. The biggest of our factors, in other words, 5, goes with the sign of the middle term. The sign of the middle term is negative, so the 5 goes there. The 2 okay. goes there. And then if we multiplied that back together, we'd get x squared minus 5x plus 2x minus 10. Combine those terms, I get x squared minus 3x minus 10. That merely is a check to make sure we did it correctly. All right. You don't have any more problems, Nick? No, I don't have my homework. All right. Well, let's call it a session. All right. All right. I'll talk to you next week.